Um, so can I remind members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout Parliament buildings and online. Um, there are four members attending the meeting in person and that makes three members attending via video conference. One is still joining us, I think. Um, so the following members are present in person, myself, Emma Sheeran, Mike Nesbitt, Michelle McElveen and Christopher Stalford. And the following members are attending via video conference. And so we've Carl McKillen, who's not just with us yet, Mark Durkin and Paula Bradshaw. So um, can everyone ensure that their mobile devices are on Wi-Fi to avoid interference? And we'll start with agenda item uh, one, and that is apologies. We haven't received any apologies for today's meeting. Um, Chairperson's business, agenda item two, uh, so Chair's business. So we have the temporary provisions in the standing orders, uh, the temporary standing orders 110, 115 and 116 and associated guidance are found between pages 5 and 14 of your meeting packs. Temporary standing orders make a range of provisions, including allowing for members to participate in meetings remotely and allowing for decisions to be taken without a meeting. The standing orders relate to statutory and standing committees, so I propose this, this, that this ad hoc committee adopts them for its proceedings also. So, are members in the room content for the committee to adopt the temporary standing orders? Yes. Yep. And members via video conference? Content. Yep, they all seem to be indicating. Um, matters are rising. So that's agenda item three. Uh, this is, relates to inviting written briefings. Since our last meeting, we agreed by correspondence to seek written briefings, allowing us to progress with our work at a time when we're unable to meet due to the coronavirus pandemic. And these briefings will contribute to the report of the committee. We initially sought a briefing on human rights work in Wales, and this was provided by Simon Hoffman, who's a professor of law at the Hillary Clinton School of Law, uh, Swansea University, from whom we will receive a briefing at our next meeting. And this submission was published online, and we'll consider further submissions in the next agenda item. And everyone should have received that written briefing via email. I propose that the committee continues to publish written submissions on its web pages over the course of its work once members have had time to consider them. This may help to inform the debate and avoid duplication. Are members in the room content that written submissions are published once members have considered them? Yeah. yeah. Are members uh, attending remotely content? Content. Yeah. Thumbs up there. So um, the next agenda item is correspondence. Um, the correspondence memo was on page 16 of your pack. In addition to the written briefing from Simon Hoffman that we've already referred to, we've received a submission from Dermot Nesbitt, who was involved in the negotiations that led to the Good Friday Agreement. He will brief the committee on 15th of October, after which his written submission will be published. Uh, the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission has submitted a paper from the United Nations Human Rights Committee which identifies a list of issues on the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. You'll see that the Bill of Rights for the North is mentioned in paragraph 3. Are members in the room content to note the correspondence as set out in the correspondence memo? Content. Are members that are attending by video conference content? Content, sir. Everybody's content. So we now move on um, to agenda item number five. We um, have a briefing from Dominic Brave QC. The clerk's memo, together with the written submission and an addendum, can be found um, starting at page 49 on your, on your EPAC. I'd like to welcome Dominic Grieve to the meeting. Dominic, if you're content, can you begin your briefing? That, thank, thank you very much, and thank you very much, Chair, for inviting me to participate. And I hope that you will have all have had the two briefing papers which I produced for the, um, the committee. The first one, which was just about derogation, and then I was asked to amplify on that <clears throat> with a note between the difference between Human Rights Act and the NIHRC proposals. And I'd like to emphasise at the outset that in trying to provide you with these documents uh, and my take on this, I wasn't in any way seeking to indicate 
one way or the other the direction of travel in which you might wish to go or not. But I think it is important to understand that um, as a result of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, there was a proposal put forward for doing something which on the face of it, in the way it's been interpreted by the NIHRC, is markedly different from the approach that was taken in the United Kingdom by the then Labour government in seeking to incorporate the European Convention into our own law through the Human Rights Act. And as you will recall, the convention, the promise in the Good Friday Agreement at that stage, in fact, the convention hadn't been incorporated through the HRA. So one of the promises that was made was that the Labour government was going to do it, and indeed it did. But in addition to that was the possibility for you to have a completely different set of, uh, a, 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 a Bill of Rights, which, and I wouldn't seek, and you have to rely on other people about this as to how it should be interpreted. Uh, the indication was a Bill of Rights that responded to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. And it may be that those who put this forward had in mind something which looked at the sectarian divide, the problem of, um, of different communities not having sufficient regard to the rights and interests of others, uh, and was seeking to limit it or envisaging that it would be limited in that context. But as you'll be aware, in fact, what's happened is that the NIHRC's proposals did, I think, go much wider than that. But they may have been right to do that. As I say, I, I make absolutely no judgment on that issue whatsoever. But simply that I think that they did go further than the narrow wording. And the question for you is going to be, do you want to pursue what I would describe as the NIHRC proposals, uh, which have clearly been very carefully worked up uh, and put forward, but which were rejected by the UK government uh, after they were first published? Or do you want to try and go for something else? Now, when I was first approached to do this paper, the issue was specifically about derogation. And I sought to explain in my first paper that derogation in the context of the Human Rights Act is possible, although there are some areas where it is prevented from happening by the text of the convention itself. And I listed those off. Uh, particularly Article 2, the right to life, except in respect of death resulting from lawful acts of war. Article 3, torture. 4, paragraph 1, slavery. 7, no punishment without law. Uh, and there's also Protocol 13 on the total abolition of the death penalty, which the UK government uh, found uh, in uh, actually did have a bite in a, in a case concerning the transfer of a, a prisoner, two prisoners to Iraqi custody during the Iraq war. Now, that's pretty limited. But clearly, if the NIHRC proposals were to be adopted, and you were to start incorporating into a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights, a lot of general rights to which the UK is a signatory by virtue of international treaties, then as the NIHRC rightly says, those rights are not capable of being derogated from because the international treaty doesn't provide for their derogation. On the other hand, you could argue that the United Kingdom would never have signed up to these treaties if they thought they were going to be immediately incorporated into our own domestic law. Because they are of a very general nature and in the dualist system which we have in this country, which means that international treaties only have force of law if they are incorporated into our own law, we are signed up to thousands of treaties, literally thousands. I think it's about 14,000 treaties in all, most of which have no domestic impact whatsoever. The Human Rights Act and the European Convention of Human Rights is in that sense exceptional, as indeed were, of course, the EU treaties. Uh, which we were bound to by virtue of being members of the EU. 
So you have here, if I can put it this way, two completely different concepts of what rights might be. And the difficulty I can envisage you're going to have is that if you want to start crafting a Bill of Rights, which is as extensive as the NIHRC have proposed, you're going to have to think through the consequences of doing that in terms of the extent that it does two things. One, it's going to judicialize a large number of decisions which are currently left entirely to the political sphere to be determined by politicians answerable to their electorates. And of course, I'm very aware that the Northern Ireland context in this respect is different from elsewhere in the United Kingdom because of the nature of the assembly and the nature of the way in which your elections are held. That's one aspect. And the second aspect is that if you're dealing specifically with derogation, which is why I was originally asked, I think, to provide the papers, you're going to have to face up to the fact that you're going to be creating, for Northern Ireland at least, if the United Kingdom government is prepared to do this, a structure which is going to lead, most of which I suspect will be incapable of being derogated from under any circumstances because to do so would highlight the fact that we were no longer observing what is technically an international obligation, even if that international obligation today is not actually directly enforceable through our own system. Now, I know that's a bit of a mouthful, and I hope that my two notes are comprehensible. But that in brief is, I think, the dilemma that you are going to have. And I'm very happy to have a discussion and go through with you the, the points that you may have arising from those two papers. I've tried to distill what's in those two papers into just a few words in starting this discussion this afternoon. Um, I should make clear, different countries have different traditions. Uh, it's quite obvious that the NIHRC went to South Africa and Canada and looked at different models of bills of rights, most of which have effectively a judicial supremacy element, just indeed as ultimately the Constitution of the United States of America does. But as that's not been our national tradition here nationally through the Westminster Parliament, the Human Rights Act was crafted with a completely different set of intentions. And therefore, the key question, I think, is how you reconcile what you want to do in Northern Ireland or what would wish Westminster to do for you in Northern Ireland with what... Um, is the reality of the current structure under which we are operating. Now, that doesn't mean that there isn't a halfway house, because you could limit a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland to those things which I suppose the UK government in 2011 was insisting were the things it was expecting, which was about parity of esteem, trying to reduce sectarianism and trying to make ensure that discrimination on the grounds of political or religious belief was eliminated. Uh, but that's a rather limited concept. And the alternative is to try to go further, but then you're going to face the challenges which I've tried to identify in both my papers. I hope that's a helpful start. I'm very happy to take questions on this. And indeed, as I always say to people, if you think there's anything I've missed out, I'm very happy to try to answer on that as well in so far as I can. That's us. Thank you very much. Um, everyone can hear everyone. Yep. Um, so I'm going to start with the question initially and then um, I'll open it up to, to everyone else in the room. So um, thanks for your presentation, um, Mr. Reeve. I just I, I want to, to get some clarification, I suppose, on something that was mentioned in, in both of your papers, particularly the latter one and, and which you sort of finished on there. And so you've referred to the fact, obviously, that the Human Rights Commission here in the North would have went farther um, than the, the British government, maybe, or the rights according to the British government and obviously my perspective on that would be why why would they not but I, th I think I would like some broadening on what what we can do here in terms of what we can legislate for that we're not depending on Westminster to legislate for you, you refer like we, we can go so far um, before we go into reserve matters if you if you would speak to that yeah, yes of course uh as I understand it, and I, I think there was probably likely to be agreement around the committee on this, the original idea in the Belfast Good Friday Agreement was that there would be 
intercommunity consultations by the NIHRC, it would produce a blueprint for a Northern Ireland Bill of Rights that would be enacted by the UK Parliament uh, as a reserved matter. Um, it would therefore be essentially imposed thereafter on the Northern and the Northern Ireland executive and the assembly would be wholly bound by its content. Of course, the Westminster Parliament being sovereign can ultimately change any statute it likes uh, and the possibility therefore must exist that it could, in at a future date, change it. Although the NIHRC proposals envisage that there would be a lock mechanism in the Bill of Rights, which said that the content of the Bill of Rights could only be changed if there was cross-community agreement in Northern Ireland that that should happen. So trying to provide a lock. But of course, like anything else with um, UK legislation, you can always get round it. We saw that with the Fixed Term Parliament Act when the, Mr Johnson's government was able to pass through the House of Commons a further statute that bypassed the Fixed Term Parliaments Act to have a general election last year, notwithstanding the fact that the Fixed Term Parliaments Act still exists. So you can do that. Um, now, what can you do on your own? Anything which is devolved to Northern Ireland must be capable of being legislated on in Northern Ireland. And in a way, human rights are not an abstract concept because human rights apply to different activities carried out by government or by individuals. So if you wish to implement something which can have an impact on what you would see as human rights, but is within a devolved area, I don't think there is anything constitutionally to prevent you from doing this. I note that you are going to hear shortly from uh, Wales, and you will be aware that the Welsh have enacted legislation about children's rights that goes further to what exists at Westminster and could well be characterised as being human rights orientated strikes me that you have the same power to do that in Northern Ireland. And there may well be all sorts of other areas in which you can also do this. But um, ultimately, of course, if the Westminster Parliament is unhappy about that, it has, I suppose, the capacity of overriding it uh, by the passage of Westminster legislation, or that's a most undesirable outcome. Um, and there will be some things which I think will come within the reserved areas. Um, so I, there is, I think, an interesting issue here as to exactly how far you can go. You know what your devolved responsibilities are. And I think within those devolved responsibilities, as long as what you're doing doesn't have an impact on the rights under the Human Rights Act and undermines them, you can probably do what you like. I've, I've just got one more question um, I know that this is something um, you've been exercised on in terms of the impact of Brexit um, for, for us here in the North in relation to human rights the, the big change through Brexit is obviously that the Charter of Fundamental Rights of the European Union uh, which clearly provides additional rights to those which uh, were in the European Convention on Human Rights, uh, will cease to bite. Uh, that was the subject of a lot of debate in Parliament in, 20, it was in 2018 when it went through. Um, and uh, it was clear that there was a majority at Westminster, which was quite happy to see at that time, and I think probably must still be the position today, <laughs> which were perfectly happy to see some of those rights disappear. Uh, equally, there were some things like, for example, environmental rights, or some, whether they're characterised as human rights or not, that's a different matter, which some people wanted to see preserved and the government made some concessions for doing so. But there's no doubt that the total body, corpus as the Latin word is for it, of rights which come, which currently people enjoy, both by virtue 
of the Convention, but above all by virtue of our EU membership, will be significantly reduced when we leave the EU. Now, you can look, for example, to see whether some of those uh, you wish to try to preserve. And again, the question is, are those devolved matters or are they reserved matters? Uh, are they issues of um, economic policy? Is that macroeconomic policy? Where do they lie? Um, there's always the possibility uh, for difficulty with this. You'll be aware, or some of you may be aware, that when I was Attorney General, I lost a case in the Supreme Court over Welsh devolution because it was unclear whether the Agricultural Wages Board was uh, an employment matter or an agricultural matter. One was devolved and the other one was reserved. And the Supreme Court clarified it uh, and clarified where it lay. But there was a difficulty in knowing whether this covered a reserved or a devolved matter. So, and, uh, and I'll just follow up with this and then that, that'll be me and I'll, I'll pass to, to Mike. But w then it, it, would it be fair to say that it would be your opinion that it would be potentially a, a solution if people perceive that we were going to lose some rights, particularly in the North, as a result of our impending uh, removal from the European Union? that a Bill of Rights for the North particularly could, could be a solution to that? It might be. I think I wasn't asked to advise on this when I produced course, my two sorry. papers specifically on the, Bre the Brexit. So I think I, you're going to need to go away and do rather a bit more work on this because the rights which people currently have and which are enforceable um, within the context of the Charter of Fundamental Rights uh, some of them are what I would call add-ons to convention rights or clarifications of convention rights. There are things like data protection, for example, that goes further than what is provided for in the convention, although the two probably march together quite closely. But you see, I think with data protection, you're likely to find that that's a reserved matter to Westminster. So you, you're, you're going to have to identify what it is which is devolved, you currently enjoy by virtue of the Charter of Fundamental Rights, which has been hitherto enforceable in the courts, and what of it you want to preserve. There are some other things uh, of a socio-economic kind which might be possible, but you would have to go away and do quite a lot more work. I'm very happy to go away and look at that myself, but that's not what I looked at in detail before producing my two papers for you. Thank you very much. Um, Mike, I'll, I'll pass to you as Mr. Next. Okay, Chair, thank you. Um, Mike Nesbitt here, Dominic. Thank you very much for Hello, the paper Mike. and the briefing. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. You, you used at the end of your oral briefing there the, the, the well worn phrase, parity of esteem. Um, and I'm wondering if there is a difference between using that phrase in a political policy paper or, or putting it into a human rights charter. I certainly think there is. Yes, I use that word because I'm, I'm trying to... I wasn't privy to the negotiations for the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, and there are others who I think will be better qualified to identify what it was that was being envisaged. As I said earlier, there was, there's a two-stage to it. Part of it was a promise by the UK government to incorporate the European Convention on Human Rights, and the Labour government did it. And I don't think anybody has ever complained about the the extent of the incorporation. So that's one aspect. The other was clearly an idea that something more would be done, which I think to use the words, I'm trying to remember the exact wording, um, responded to um, the, ooh, I've got it here, um, uh, the exact words, but it responded to the particular conditions of Northern Ireland. So I think what was being envisaged was does Northern Ireland need a Bill of Rights which responds in some very particular way to its circumstances and is part of the effective package of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement for taking forward Northern Ireland collectively? Um, and, of course, the NIHRC would argue, and I want to make this quite clear, that their own recommendations were they were trying to respond to exactly that. But I, I, I don't find it difficult to see why others would say that they went far beyond what was envisaged. 
Now, as for parity of esteem, I agree that translating the word parity of esteem into um, a legally biting human rights text is probably a very unwise thing to try and do. But I was simply using that term because I think it was what was what was being thought about was how can some of the underlying problems that have beset Northern Ireland in terms of people feeling discriminated against in different contexts be addressed by additional rights? I think that's what they had in mind. Others will tell me that I'm wrong in that, but that's what I'd always understood to be the case. I, I think I'm wondering if you drill down, is it to do with the, the balance of control between the politicians and the judiciary. So if we took, for example, socio, socio and economic rights, um, politically they might be aspirational, but if they're in a bill of rights, uh, that it goes to a whole different level and the control moves from Stormont to the High Court. Absolutely right. Yes. It's quite clear. And indeed, this is the criticism that has been made, even of the way in which the European Convention on Human Rights has been operating. If you look at Lord Sumption's Reith lectures, one of which was given in Belfast, um, you will see that he worries about judicialization, substituting judges' views for what are essentially political decisions. And he highlights his own concern that as judges have to make essentially binary choices, which are usually black or white, handing this to the judges has a twofold effect. One, it uh, reduces public faith in politicians, because in the sense the politicians shrug their shoulders and say, well, there's nothing I can do about this. It's been decided elsewhere. And it also exposes the judiciary to political criticism because they are making decisions which would appear to have a political content in, for example, socio-economic consequences. And this was the big question when we incorporated the CHR with the Human Rights Act. You'll be aware that in the four or five years, in the early 90s, there was a huge public debate. Um, were we going to have a Bill of Rights? My own party, that I was then a member, no longer my party, but I was then a member of the Conservative Party, played zero role in this, or very few people did. So it was essentially, in United Kingdom level, a debate which took place between the nationalist parties, um, the Liberal Democrats and Labour. But interestingly, the decision was made at the end of it by the Labour government to go for what I would describe as a relatively minimalist approach. And I think one of the reasons they did that was because they became aware of just how profound the consequences would be within the UK constitutional framework of moving to a system where you had either entrenched rights or essentially you made a Supreme Court or the House of Lords of it then was the ultimate arbiter of everything. Um, and they didn't want that, partly, I dare say, because they hoped to be in government and hoped to make some tough decisions when they were there. So they didn't do it. Um, and as I say, if you look at the LAIHRC paper, it is in a way going back to that early debate in the early 90s and saying, let's take it on from there and give Northern Ireland something which is significantly different from what uh, was produced with the Human Rights Act in 1998. Final question, if I may, Dominic. You, you touched on the question of which legislature might bring in a bill, who might repeal it, who might amend it. My question is, how quickly does, does thinking on human rights evolve? Well, I think thinking on human rights evolves all the time um, and there can be change, but you, you don't have to look too far at the moment, I'm talking politically at present. Um, my career has been rather bedeviled uh, by my belief that the Human Rights Act and our adherence to the European Convention on Human Rights are very good things for our country in two ways. One, I think that the rights as incorporated, although there will sometimes be complaints, make sense. And secondly, I think that in terms of our adherence to the convention, it is a very good example of the United Kingdom's soft power. And to put ourselves in a situation where we were no longer signatories of the convention, 
with, I think, the appalling, particularly as we're now leaving the EU, the Council of Europe remains the last significant pan-European forum of a generalised kind in which we participate. And if we were to leave the Convention, we would have to leave the Council of Europe. But as I say, in terms of my political career, it's why David Cameron and I parted company in 2014, because he wanted to do something different. And what he wanted to do in 2014 was to have a bill of, UK Bill of Rights, which was ECHR, if I can use this expression, minus rather than ECHR plus, which is what I think your Bill of Rights is all about. And have things improved since then? Well, Theresa May, when she was prime minister, talked about another going for an ECHR minus Bill of Rights. It featured obliquely and features obliquely in Boris Johnson's manifesto at Christmas, although there seems to be a general view that no one's going to do anything about it in a hurry. Um, but I think it's right to say that the Prime Minister's principal political advisor, Mr Cummings, is a believer that we should be leaving the European Convention on Human Rights. So if you're asking me, uh, where's the direction of travel with my old party on this? I would say that I haven't, although it's been 10 years, frankly, of beating about the bush, achieving absolutely nothing apart from rhetorical flourishes, for which perhaps I might be personally thankful and even possibly take some small credit. Um, the atmosphere has not significantly improved. And whilst there are many organisations in the United Kingdom that believe that we should move on from uh, the Human Rights Act to having a Bill of Rights, which is ECHR plus, if I can use that word, I don't see that happening anytime soon. Although times can change and public opinion can change and political views can change. So obviously one of the things I was flagging up in my two papers is that if Northern Ireland wants to take its project forward, it will be doing it against a background at a UK level, which I think is fairly negative to the development of some of the rights that the NIHRC paper talks about. Excellent. Dominic, thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Chair. No problem, Mike. Uh, we'll go to if, if anyone in the room has questions. Yes, I do, actually. Yes, I have some questions. Hello, Don. It's Christopher Stalford here. Good to see you again. Um, Good afternoon. Thank you. Um, you. You referenced in your um, introductory remarks the reference in the, the section of the Belfast Agreement uh, that referred to the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland um, and what a Bill of Rights would look like. Um, would you be able to talk to that? What do you think in terms of drafting or crafting a document, what particular circumstances do you think uh, are unique that aren't already in legislation protected? Well, I think you, you, you raise a very interesting question, and I think it's very difficult for particularly somebody who doesn't live in Northern Ireland, although I'm familiar with Northern Ireland and love coming there, necessarily to, to answer. But, but I think that what was intended in this uh, scope, the additional rights to re reflect the principles of mutual respect for the identity and ethos of both communities and parity of esteem and taken together to constitute a Bill of Rights. I'm just, I found that the, um, I didn't have it to hand a moment ago, but I've got it in front of me now. Yeah. Um, and, and everybody knows that Northern Ireland's problems have been because of lack of trust between different communities sectarian division, uh, discrimination of long-standing uh, be between majority and minority communities, depending on where you happen to be. Um, and that those, I think, are the issues which are the particular circumstances of Northern Ireland. Mm. So I start with the idea in my head, with, if that's the case, what is it that one might start looking at which could provide greater assurance um, within the Northern Ireland context. Um, and, and that, I think, is about, coming back to Mike's question, Mike Nesbitt's question, the parity of esteem, not easy to translate into law, but it's about um, building up possibly on existing rights by looking at the Northern Ireland context and asking, can we go further 
to say something more about the way people should essentially, both the state and public institutions, should treat individuals. Um, in paragraph 12 of your additional um, paper, yep. um, if we go, yes, it raises, if it raises, sorry, if it is capable of legal interpretation and cannot be derogated from, it raises potential problems for any government to observe and cast the judiciary as the ultimate arbiter of economic and political choices with the potential attendant litigation that it might generate. Um, short of having a, a written constitution, which we obviously we don't, um, you suggesting that we potentially end up in a, well, anywhere else has a written, almost like America, where you have you know, cast in stone, these, this is it, and if you don't, if you deviate from that, or are found to be in breach from that, then the government could end up constantly being litigated against? Uh, yes. I, let's, let's be clear about this. We, we live in a, although some would argue that access to justice has become more difficult recently uh, because of a lack of legal aid, um, human rights is one area where legal aid is available, and there's no doubt, and we've seen it in, in England, that um, the opportunity to seek redress through the courts for something which somebody believes they are entitled to as a right can lead people to bring individual claims in court against public authorities. Um, and whilst this isn't, um, uh, is not an impossible situation, it's very costly for government, as I know from my time as Attorney General, because the government has to decide whether it's going to resist these claims or not. So fighting them through can be very hard, and often the government has to bear the costs and will not recover them from anywhere else. And it takes up time and it takes up energy. And some of the rights, um, picking on the NIHRC's paper, for example, are by their nature very vague uh, because they are, can I put, have, I, I use the word aspirational. They are uh, statements of intent by government, which I don't think governments, when they signed up to it, ever intended to have to answer for in a court. Mm -hmm. Now, you could argue they shouldn't have signed them. Yeah. Um, and indeed, there is a very famous judgment by a great Northern Ireland judge, Lord Kerr, in, in a particular case, which I cited in my paper, where he said, well, I did, he couldn't see why, if we signed up to these in, international obligations, the court shouldn't enforce them. But that's not a view taken by the vast majority of the judiciary, who I think see it as an absolute minefield. And to take the obvious example, on socioeconomic rights, uh, which I cite some of them, mm -hmm. rights which say that you know, aspirationally people should be trying to spend the maximum possible to reduce poverty. What does that mean in practice if you're facing, for example, a massive economic crisis and you decide you're going to peg or reduce the level of benefit support. Yeah. Is the decision on that going to be made by a judge or is it going to be made by politicians who are answerable to the electorate at elections? And I think these are some quite profound issues to which there are in truth no easy answers. Thank but you. you can see why opinion gets polarized on this. Absolutely, thank you. Is that you, Christopher? Michelle, do you have a couple of Thank you. Y your grant? Yeah. Well, we'll go tell everyone that's um, linked in via video conference. Um, I'm trying to see if anyone's raising their hand. They're not. So I think some of the members are in on their phone and mightn't be able to indicate. So if we just go, go around in, in order, does that work? So Mark, do you have any questions? Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Dominic, for your presentation uh, today, as well as your written submissions. It's just to support your very last remark there was <coughs> about, I suppose, tough decisions that have to be made and their implications, potentially in times of economic uh, crisis. So although we're not quite there yet, uh, we, <laughs> we sadly seem to be he headed that way. But I'm thinking more the current health crisis. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know you, you've touched on this a fair wee bit in, in your initial submission, but I was wondering if we could maybe pick your brain a wee bit on the balancing of uh, civil liberties and human rights at times like this. And, and do you think there's anything that we could learn that could be applicable to any future Bill of Rights that we might have here? 
you raise a very interesting I I issue because, of course, the legislation that was enacted by the government over COVID is, um, uh, interestingly, it doesn't really seem to have given rise to a huge amount of public disquiet, but no. it's draconian in its quality. I mean, uh, eye-poppingly so, but everybody went along with it because they thought it was necessary. Interesting news has then seen how in practice its generality has proved quite difficult to interpret and enforce. So uh, what are the police powers for breaking up groups? Um, was, uh, forgive my saying, it was Mr Cummings in breach or not of the regulations when he was driving up to Durham or taking his day trip to Barnard Castle? Um, these are actually quite complex issues. I have worried about some of the provisions uh, which have taken place. Uh, funny enough, the thing which has worried me more than anything else, although it doesn't yet seem to have really raised its head, is about marriage. Marriage has become impossible in this country as a result of the regulatory changes brought in by the powers under this Act. Now, one might think superficially that doesn't matter, but actually, people getting married or not married have profound fiscal consequences if one of the parties of a partnership dies unmarried yeah. or married. I, I, there is a bit of me which is waiting for the first claim by an unmarried partner saying that they couldn't get married or have a civil partnership because of COVID and the law that was passed, but then the partner died and that as a consequence, they prevented from getting the fiscal advantages which would have come had they remained married, such as, for example, inheritance tax. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, there are some really, I think, potentially quite serious matters here. And the longer this goes on, the more likely they're going to pile up. But as one always finds with these problems, it takes a little bit of time before the problem detonates further down the track. I mean, just bear in mind that Article 12 of the European Convention on human rights is about the right to get married. It's absolutely quite clear. And at the moment, you can't get married in the United Kingdom, and except I mean, there may be some quite exceptional dispensations by the Anglican Church. But that, I think, is where we are at present, unless I've misunderstood the position. OK, well, thank you so for that. There are some things you might like. There are certainly things. But equally, perhaps I should just say this in conclusion on that, you know, it was also got to bear in mind that Difficult circumstances require difficult actions. And um, in passing the COVID legislation, I don't think the United Kingdom government was about to try to close down uh, in some horrible way uh, our civil liberties, but it did curtail them very significantly. And I was pleased when the House of Commons insisted that there should be a much uh, earlier sunset clause than had originally been proposed by the government for the legislation, and the government backed down on that. OK, thanks, Donna. That's me. Mark, that's you. I see Paula has indicated that she would like to ask a question. Sorry, that's it. OK, thank you. It's really just a follow on from that last point there um, in relation to I work with a lot of alienated Fathers in particular who have been um, bravely impacted by the knockdown where they would have their ex-partners have used the pandemic as a way to deny them access to their children, whether outstanding or sorry, in situ contact orders. And so obviously the socioeconomic response of the Department of Health and others, Department of Justice, closing the courts were the right and, and just thing to do in the pandemic, but they then had an impact on human rights. So it's just really how you could resolve that and what your thoughts are on it. Well, this, this, this highlights some of the really difficult issues. And perhaps coming back to what I was saying, the, the, the slight problem about judicialization. Uh, let, I think we need to be clear about this. It's argued, for example, in it, it, the government has been seeking to reduce the incidence of the spread of COVID by placing a whole series of restrictions on the population. It has been argued that one of the consequences of doing that is that uh, people who, for example, uh, have potential cancer are not getting access to all potential eye problems. I've got a great friend of mine who's an eye surgeon who's worried that, in fact, patients are not coming forward to have, and they may well go blind as a consequence of not getting an early appointment because the hot, that his department is essentially not operating. Now, 
These, of course, are all balancing exercises. And uh, if you look at the European Convention on Human Rights, most of the rights are about balancing exercises which governments can justify. But if you start including and widening those rights, socioeconomic health rights, which are well, you know, a, sub, a subset of socioeconomic rights, clearly you are widening the scope for there being arguments taken before a court that somebody's rights have been infringed. Indeed, I can even see that could already happen with the Human Rights Act. It, I'm not aware of it's happened so far in, in, uh, this, this, in, the, in the COVID saga, but I can see that it could. Uh, and clearly, if you have much wider socioeconomic rights, the chances of that happening are much greater. So mm -hmm. there are, I think, some lessons. And, and as time goes by, I think we will have more opportunity to see what some of the unintended consequences of the COVID legislation may or may not be. Okay, thank you. And just to go back then up to the original uh, Bill of Rights Forum here in Northern Ireland in 20, or sorry, 2007 and 2008, um, part of the problem was that we, the, the way it was structured, there were so many voices around the table, so many lobbyists and stakeholders. And for example, some of the um, suggestions put forward was the right that everybody should have a home, you know, and... And so it just got, you know, not ridiculous, but it just, it was, was never going to be deli deliverable. And so then the, um, what was being proposed was that they would be aspirational and progressive rights that would probably never be achieved, but there's always an expectation. So it's, you, you, I think you used aspirational, but I think we used progressive rights at the time. So how do we, again, balance that as we go forward? Because some of the, the concerns in the past, or maybe even present um, around the Northern Ireland situation, particular circumstances was, the denial of rights to homes or denial of rights to other public services. And so they're maybe not human rights, but they're certainly socio-economic rights. Uh, yes, um, I, I, I entirely understand what you're saying. And uh, the, the key to this, I mean, it is quite interesting that um, the one right which was not incorporated in the Human Rights Act was a general right against discrimination because the UK government argued that that wasn't actually necessary in the UK context. Now, maybe that is... Oh. Um, it's a right not to be discriminated against in, in the context of your own... Uh, 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 the Human Rights Act... But there may be a question that you could go further over the question of, of general non-discrimination based on status. Um, and that's something you might like to look at. But you're right that once you start going down this road, if it's, I, I'm very wary of trying to put in law aspirations. Heaven knows I've been often enough recorded when I was attorney general, uh, governments come along and say, I want some symbolic legislation. And I say, don't do it, because legislation is there to produce law. It's there to produce something which a judge can look at and say this is being observed or it isn't. Once you start putting in symbolism because you think it looks good, then if you're leaving it, you have to understand that you're going to leave it to be interpreted by somebody other than Parliament, and it will be interpreted ultimately by judges. And they have a job to do in doing that. And as I say, I think they're the ones who will be most reluctant to be landed with having to rule on what appear to be aspirations. Because they will say, well, look, the, the implementation of an aspiration is a matter where you take your politicians to task. We can't decide what they themselves seem to be incapable of deciding themselves for them. And if we do that, it reduces your politicians to, to ciphers. And I think one has to be quite careful on this. Uh, it's a very, where you draw the dividing line is probably the hardest thing of all. And here I am, as I say, you, you've got, I have to be honest about myself. I'm a firm upholder of the convention and the HRA, which I believe are essential. But I accept, speaking personally, when you move outside of that, it's not that I don't think that you can't have other rights in a Bill of Rights. I, I did some work on, on various things that we might have. But you have to ask the question, is this serving a useful practical purpose or is it just going to lead 
to people having expectations which in practice can't be met and the frustration that then comes from trying to enforce those by going to court, which by its very nature tends to be a long drawn out and rather unsatisfactory process and may well end with people feeling even more dissatisfied at the end than they did at the beginning. And that I think is essentially a political choice. And that's one of the issues that I think the committee is going to have to grapple with when it tries to find the best way forward. Paula, is that you? S sorry, I, um, I really muted myself. Yeah. Yes, thank, thank you very much. That was very helpful. No problem. Thank you. Before um, I let Carolyn uh, just uh, Mike has reminded me, uh, just as a, a point of your, for your own information, Dominic, one of the, the first easements here in the north in terms of the lockdown um, related to uh, marriage for, for people Good. in situations where one partner well, you're ahead of us, was, was, was ill. So, um, Carl, do you have questions? I do, yes. Right. Okay. Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, Dominic. Um, and thank you for your... Um, your presentation, but also the evidence that you sent to us was really interesting. Um, and you can even, I'm sure, understand from some of the questions that you've been asked that each of us are trying to work out what we can do. Um, and the question is for me is that, you know, even the whole issue around the Good Friday Agreement and indeed the Human Rights Act and the implementation of Section 75 and Section 76 was all brought forward because there was a denial of rights, okay? Yeah. And even in the suspension of the Assembly in the last three years, there have been two fairly big court rulings. On one, there needed to be an anti-poverty strategy yep. and there needed to be an Irish language and, Ulster, uh, and a strategy for the Ulster Scots yeah. Cultural and Heritage because they were... Um, written into agreements that were yeah. legally binding, okay? Mm. So, which both the British and the Irish government signed up to, so they're international in, in their stature. Yeah. So, you can understand why I don't agree that I would like to see as much in legislation as possible, mm. because it's a, it's a euphemism called our particular circumstances when the whole premise of disagreements were about the denial of rights and the denial of justice and, and all that came with that. Um, and, and, and each of us can argue that from each of our different political perspectives. But unless there is legislation there and it is honoured and respected and not, not even more than that, that's not aspirational, that it's implemented, you the courts have to be a place where people need to seek a sense of resolution. And we have had judges who have, in my opinion, had the, the legal um, authority to make those decisions, but didn't based because they didn't want to seem, be seen to make political decisions. Mm. So, as you said, it's the, the, the hardest thing is going to be about drawing the line. Mm. What is that line? Who draws it? And, and how are we settle on it? But the question I would have is, you mentioned the European Charter of Fundamental Rights. Mm in relation and you have been quite strong on it um hmm. um so it, it's about that impact the withdrawal of that on the bill of rights and particularly the the human rights act here in section 75 hmm. and indeed section 76 about institutions what hmm. would your thoughts be on that and then i think it was emma the chair to start raise the issue around brexit hmm. um and some sort of, sort of rolling back. I mean, we have had some British, they're not politicians, it's Dominic. Um, it's um, the the advisors who have said mm. that, um, you know, as much of, of this as we can d dismantle, the better, which is quite frightening. I can in this society mm. in the 21st century where, where there's still, you know, ever change in human rights, but also, um, derogation on not to implement rights. So I would just like your thoughts on the Good Friday Agreement, the international obligations of both the Irish and the British government in relation to having a Bill of Rights. And even just if you can't comment on my own neuralgia about it not being enshrined in legislation because 
you know, we had a suspension of the institution chair based on an abuse of rights. And then the last question would be in relation to Brexit and indeed the European Charter fundamental rights. What impact would that have on the, on the potential of bringing forward a Bill of Rights in the context of respecting and, and adhering to Section 75 and Section 76? I know that's a bit of a mouthful, Dominic, but that's I'm trying. <laughs> I'm trying to respect the I'm trying to respect the work that you put into your two papers, yeah. but also respect the political questions that I have for you as well. So thank yeah. you. Thank you. And your your questions, if I may say so, are obviously completely pertinent. Um, although they are political questions, and on the whole, the one thing I mustn't do in coming before you as a committee is I've come as an ex-law officer with an understanding of the law. I obviously have a political background, but my personal opinion in this isn't really the issue. You as a committee and as an assembly have got to decide what you want to do. And that's a matter for you to resolve. And it's quite clear that the Belfast Good Friday Agreement envisages that you are going to have a Bill of Rights. Um, it set up a mechanism for delivering it. So the fact that none has been delivered um, I, I don't wish to make too much of it being a breach of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but it is an unimplemented part of the Belfast Good Friday Agreement. Although, as I understand the UK government's position, it hasn't said that it won't do this. But the position for the last 10 years is um, you haven't come up with something which we, within our understanding, fits in to what we were expecting. Now, you're not in a position to coerce the Westminster Parliament into passing legislation, which is why there's then been the question, which I can see that we've discussed this afternoon, as to whether or not Northern Ireland would like to do something on a cross-community basis, which would be very remarkable indeed if you were to be successful in doing it. I suspect the Westminster government and Parliament would have to wake up. I mean, if you all, if you all decide collectively that you want something... It would be a rather bold Westminster government and parliament which said, no, we're not going to let you have it. So you've got an opportunity there, but you're going to have to go. You're going to have to have a you're going to have more than a majority because you have a very unusual system of governance in Northern Ireland. Um, now, as for the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, it undoubtedly conferred rights that are now going to disappear. Although, as I say, if you look at the famous EU Withdrawal Act, some of it has been preserved. And of course, for the moment, it's still there and will be there until the end of the coming year, 31st of December. And after that, it will be gone. What impact that's going to have, I don't know. And of course, some of it will be dependent on whether there's a free trade agreement with the EU or not, or whether we're leaving with no agreement at all. If there is a free trade agreement, then there may well be level playing field provisions, which will mean that essentially parts of the Charter of Fundamental Rights will continue to operate in practice, if not in their current written form. We just don't know. Now, the point was raised with me earlier. Can you in Northern Ireland pick up some of those rights and say, well, we want those rights in the Northern Ireland context? And that comes back to the, fund the question, are those rights devolved rights or are they in fact reserved matters and i think some of them are probably reserved but there may be some which are devolved but that's i'd have to go away and do some more work for you uh to answer that particular question i'd be very happy to do it it's a very interesting question and you've now you've whetted my appetite to go and have a look at it but i think many of them are in fact reserved matters data protection is the obvious example uh and data protection is a reserved matter. Uh, can I come back, Chair? Of course. Dominic, it would come as no surprise to you that as a politician, I'm going to ask political questions. But, um, but the issue is that I do think it's worth pursuing and mm. you've almost embedded yourself because even the separation of what's reserved or restricted matters to what are devolved matters. Um, while it sounds very interesting, you've also used the fact that you've got the Human Rights Commission here, you've got the Welsh Government mm. going beyond mm. Mm. what was agreed. So, like, um, without sounding like Pollyanna, put it down and stretch it out. If, if it, mm. it's something that affords people rights and protections, then 
my um, instinct would be, well, let someone argue that it's not. And yeah. I, th I think this is an opportunity for us. I mean, this is progress, us even having a Bill of Rights ad hoc committee. Yeah. Now, some would argue 21 years after the Good Friday Agreement, it's too slow and I'd be one of them. Yeah. However, I do think that we have an opportunity to try and put um, a Bill of Rights down that people can see themselves in, regardless who they are. And I know that in itself is going to be a massive challenge. Mm. But I do think there are issues, particularly that when the time, the clock's running out after the 31st of December, mm. what would it, what would it ha mean for us? And then as the course, during the course of us getting evidence and talking and listening to people um, like yourself and others, that we can, we have the luxury almost of picking out mm. things that we like, we could p potentially agree on. And it is cross community. So mm. even like the Staten Orders we refer to at the start of the committee are in such a way that they come from mm. the 1998 agreement. So um, there are mechanisms in there that, that, you know, you might like to see different. But I do think we have, we, we, there's an imperative rather than an opportunity to try, particularly in relation to the European Charter of Fundamental Rights, to try and get that separation of what, irrespective of if it's devolved or restricted or reserved, that we should put down as much as possible. And I, I hope the committee accepts your challenge to do that, but I work for us since we've ignited a bit of interest in this. So thank you. Thank you very much. As I say, if I may say so, that the fact I was asked to participate in this and that the committee is doing this, um, I saw as a very positive issue um, in terms of, uh, of political development in Northern Ireland. But I probably also recognise that as you progress, you may find you have differences of view within your own committee as to the right way forward. And democratic politics is all about compromise. But I I would particularly recommend looking at what's been going on in Wales and what's happening in Scotland, because certainly with children's rights, for example, I can think of no reason why you can't pursue the same course of action if that is what you wanted to do. And there will be other examples, and you can certainly look at the Charter of Fundamental Rights and see if you can pick things up from there that you want to, you, you want to preserve in the Northern Ireland context. But as I say, there you have to look carefully at reserved against devolved um, uh, powers, although it's also worth pointing out that the original idea was that it was going to be a, something enacted by the Westminster Parliament on your behalf. So there it's true that if you think that there are rights which are reserved rights, which you want to see enacted by Westminster specifically for Northern Ireland, you have a complete entitlement to pass your own resolutions asking Westminster to look at it. Whether the government does or not, is a question I'm not in a position to answer. Uh, but there's nothing to prevent you doing it. I think your clerks would confirm that. I don't think it's ultra vires of your time to say, we, the committee, think that this is what we would like to see. One of the arguments, as you'll be aware, with the NIHRC's proposals was that it, quite apart from the fact that Westminster rejected them, mm -hmm. there was a sense the government rejected them and said they went much further than had been envisaged. There was a sense that they were also quite controversial in the Northern Ireland context. So there was never any clarity that there was cross-community support for the form that the NIHRC put forward. Indeed, there were dissenting opinions even within the Commission itself. So clearly, if you can, by your own debates and discussions, uh, get to a point where there is a broad degree of consensus, I would have thought that it's talking politics now rather than law, that Westminster would have to listen, would certainly have to provide some response to what you were asking for. Thank you, Chair. OK, Carl, um, I think Christopher is looking in for, for one final short question. No, I just wanted to say I think that the last point that Dominic made is absolutely crucial and key. This is only going to work if it can be carried forward on a cross-community basis. And I was involved uh, oh, what, 10, 11 years ago now in the Bill of Rights Forum, and that failed to produce an, an, an agreed outcome precisely because of this tension between 
sort of maximalism and minimism. And if we can find some common ground and some centre ground, then that's probably, uh, I think that needs to be the driving, the overriding desire of the committee because um, that tension um, exists and if we're going to have something that can command community support it needs to be across the community that everyone can say this is good so I think your, your final point was a crucial one. Okay thanks Christopher thank you Dominic. Um, well thank you very much. You. I've been a pleasure and a privilege to, uh, to appear by Sally uh, and uh, <laughs> thank you very much for asking me. Brilliant. Well, maybe yeah. if you are doing further work, we, we'll maybe be able to take written submission from you again. I'm sure, we can we can follow that up with you. Thanks very much. If you if you want to to leave the call now, I will do so. <laughs> thank you very much indeed. Cheers, Thank you. Dominic. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. So um, the next item on our agenda um, is a briefing from uh, the executive office. So we have a clerk's memo uh, relating to this uh, between pages 79 and 80 of your, of your pack. And the executive office themselves have provided a memo, uh, which is at pages 81 to 84. So you're dialing them in, are you? We've come in. <coughs> They'll come in via comms. Okay. So we've got Siobhan Broderick, who's the head of rights, language and identity, and Janet Johnson, who's the head of equality, human rights and delivering social change. So, if I can invite you both to begin your brief. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I'll open with a few comments. And as you know, New Decade New Approach uh, FM and DFM to appoint jointly a panel of five experts to assist the committee in its consideration of the Bill of Rights that is faithful to the stated intention of the 1998 agreement. So, we previously wrote to the committee seeking your views on the proposed approach to establishing the panel of experts including its proposed terms of reference and the personal description for panel members. Officials have since proceeded to adopt that approach, that I not letter. I think at the time, the committee weren't uh, in a position to provide us any specific views on the approach that we set out in respect of the frequency and methods of engagement or on the papers that we provided with, them, with the letter. So we've proceeded to identify the list of experts in this field in line with the personal description we shared with the committee. This list was informed by discussions with the Department Mental Solicitor's Office and the Northern Ireland Human Rights Commission. Officials contacted Sorry. all potential men. Can I interrupt you? You don't have a speakerphone on oh. your phone, do you? I'm actually on headphones, if it's not help. No, well, no it will, it's blurry, but we can hear you. Sorry. Tear away. I'll, I'll try again. I was trying to not put it on the general phone, but um, do you want me just to go? I'll use the phone directly, see if it makes any difference. Yeah. So, officials contacted. Is that any better, Chair? Better. Yeah, clear. Thank you. Officials contacted all potential members in May by email to ask whether they'd be interested in becoming a member of the panel of experts and to invite them to request full details in an expression of interest form should they wish to proceed. The expression of interest form allows the potential member to provide information in respect of knowledge and skills, which we set out in the personal description, which we also shared with the committee. The closing date to request an expression of interest form was the 29th of May. So the expression of interest uh, form has closing date then for the 12th, 12 noon on the 15th of June. Once completed expressions of interest forms have been received by us, senior officials will arrange to hold a focused conversation with the candidates about their expression of interest. So this conversation will cover what is expected from the panel member if appointed and discuss any potential conflict or suitability issues that are raised in the expression of interest form. So this process will allow us then to proceed to provide ministers with relevant information to inform their selection of the five member panel. So once ministers have indicated their preferred candidates, then we will obviously contact the candidates and arrange for their appointment. So we would hope that selection process will be completed by the end of June into early July, depending on the availability of the panel members because we're approaching the holiday season. So if that's helpful to the committee, that's just setting out the process that in more detail, which we set out to the committee when we wrote to them in, I think it was late April. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so j just, I suppose, in terms of less questions and, and maybe more comments from myself, um, 
so we, we have a, a slight slide there, but not by much. I think in, in the letter at the end of April, it was hoped that it, this would be finished by the end of May, start of June. So, you know, maybe have a month delay. And I think maybe taking into consideration everything that's been going on in terms of coronavirus and, and all the rest of it, that's not doing too bad. So um, the, the time scale then is, is a wee bit skewed, but following on from that, You'd be hoping then that the panel members would be ready to to work with the committee by by the time we're resuming in, in September. Yes. Yeah, or even before. You know, I'm sort of. Well, we contacted the committee clerk just to try and understand your method of working, and I suppose we weren't clear about whether you intended to do some work over the summer break. So I suppose we covered our backs by proceeding forward with our timeline, so that we probably have the panel members in place. June, early July, depending on the availability, uh, so that they could assist the committee if you intend to proceed to do some work over the summer or commission some work from the panel of experts. Okay. Uh, if any other members have, have questions or comments, Mike, sorry, I should have went to you first. Maybe no, you okay. Hi. Thank you very much, Mike Nesbitt here. Um, first of all, you said potential members were contacted in May, yeah? Yes. How, 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 did, you, how did you become a potential member? How did you draw up that list? Well, we uh, spoke to the Departmental Solicitor's Office and the Human Rights Commission and did uh, some research to look at the potential candidates that are experts in the field, and that led to the list of experts that we had. Right, so it wasn't an, an open trawl? No. Okay. And I think you mentioned that one of the first things you'll do when you close off here is look for conflicts of interest? It will be in the expression of interest form. People will be asked to declare if there's any potential or real conflicts of interest. But what would represent a real or potential conflict of interest in, in this category? Well, I suppose what we've said is the usual definition of a conflict of interest. If you could use or give a, an appearance of using your this position to further their private interests. So we've just used the usual description of a conflict of interest. and. I suppose that we would ask them to identify any potential and we would have that conversation with them just to discuss whether it is real or perceived okay. or not at all a conflict of interest. Would, would a political affiliation or perceived political affiliation be a conflict? Um, I would have to consider that, Mike, if you don't mind. Okay, okay. In the, in the person description, just two, two questions and a comment. Um, under essential, you have possession of a third level qualification law. Then a proven specialism in the area of human rights law. How are you going to judge whether somebody has a proven specialism? Well, with us, uh, an expression of interest form with us and just that out through the research and what work they've done. So I suppose we're expecting the candidates to show us the evidence of that. Okay, and then the third and final criterion is um, a proven track record of working in the field of human rights. Um, I'm just, we just heard from Dominic Grieve, who said he took a case to the courts and lost it. So a track record doesn't necessarily mean successful in terms of legal action, does it? Well, no, look, I, I'm a lawyer myself. I think track record is, I suppose, identification of the issues right. and what is justiciable or not. So I think uh, I'm sure Dominic Grieve is the former Attorney General. You know, he would qualify. It's obviously very eminent. He's very eminent. Yeah. Okay, and finally, under the desirables, the third bullet point says an understanding of EU law, the impact of the UK exit, and in particular the legal implications of the withdrawal agreement, the protocol on Ireland, Northern Ireland, and relevant domestic legislation. Um, yeah. I'm not sure anybody, I'm sure a lot of people have an opinion. But does anybody actually have an understanding of these issues? Well, well, I assume people do understand and have a, a deep understanding. I'd say the Human Rights Commission would say they have an understanding of the withdrawal agreement, and particularly the protocol and how it is meant to work, work um, in, in accordance with the legislation. Obviously, things have to be tested because this is evolving. So I think an understanding of what the legislation, there's the framework and the background to it. Yeah, just the House of Lords produced a 100-page report earlier this week on the protocol and made clear that there are huge contradictions and tensions. 
So I'm, I'm, I'm just, maybe I'm nitpicking, but I think an understanding of all these things is, um, is a bit of a stretch. Well, I think there's a balance in all of this because obviously the particular circumstances is identified in the um, in the new decade and your approach as well as the impact of leaving the European Union as something the committee would wish to consider. You would obviously want your panel of experts to have an understanding of the area of law that is relevant. Okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Jim. No problem. Michelle, you thank want to ask you, a no, question? Just, thank you very much. Just to follow on from Mike's questions um, in relation to it not being an open trawl, was there a conversation in relation to that and who took that decision? Well, we considered the relevant circumstances to that decision in the sense that it isn't a public appointment. We're conscious that the panel was a panel of experts, so it's experts in a particular field. We were also cognizant of the time period that we have to take forward this uh, process and also with the current circumstances, the pandemic, and that led us to consider all those relevant circumstances. And we took advice, obviously, from experts in the area before we we made a recommendations in that respect. To that matter. Okay, thank you. And will the panel be paid? Yes. And do you have what that's likely to pay at this stage? The fee that we expect to pay is around is five hundred pounds because that's in line with the. Uh, fees paid to part-time members of legal panels, so we thought that was a, a reasonable assumption to uh, align it to those fee ratings. £500 per? Per day. Per day. Okay, thank you very much. Christopher. Hi there, uh, Christopher Stolford here. Um, in terms of the composition of the panel, and, uh, you said earlier you're a lawyer. You know, for example, in America, there's basically two major schools of thought in terms of how the constitution is interpreted. You've got originalists and then you've got evolutionists. In terms of our panel, how are we going to ensure that there are people who have different emphases and different perspectives? Because I think the worst thing would be a panel of experts that agree on absolutely everything. I think we're cognizant of that when we spoke to both Human Rights Commission and Departmental Solicitor's Office and obviously the background to where how we've got to this point with no Bill of Rights being brought forward. So we were trying to seek a wide range of views and we've looked across a number of jurisdictions as well internationally to try and get that so that we have a, a wide range of panellists for ministers to pick from. And just one final question. In terms of uh, Mike raised the issue and I do think it's important. I think it's important that we're given advance notice just as when independent members of the policing board are appointed. Previous political activity has to be declared. I think it's important that the committee is made aware of political activity and involvement undertaken by panel members, just to inform us so that we know that. I think we had a conversation about that, didn't we? Yes, we did. Well, I'll take that under consideration. Well, I mean, if it's, put it this way, if it's not declared, I will be asking them. So, I mean, well, either, either way, we'll would, find out. Yeah. I would assume that a candidate would declare that in the section asking for conflicts of interest. Okay. Wouldn't dance enough? I'm assuming. Is it a conflict? Uh, in terms of people that are dialed in, I don't see anyone indicating. Have we lost Mark? If we start with, if we start with Paula, just on the basis of, of uh, alphabetical. I just want a clarification then. Thank you, uh, Michelle, for asking that question. So if we're meeting on a Thursday afternoon, would they be getting £500 for the Thursday or would that be deemed to be a half day? I'm just conscious that well, this is public planning. Well, we, we have also allowed for you know the £500 to be made up by two half days. So it could be £250 for a half day if they're going to come to your meeting or it depends how the committee will operate. Okay, so you're so you're not assuming then that if they have to come to committee, the morning will be time to read the, the papers and then the meeting itself. So, like one each month, be the equivalent of five hundred. I just think, I think it's a lot it of depend. I think it will depend what the committee wants and what they need to respond to. So, if the committee wants work done and they're required to do it in the morning to inform the committee in the afternoon, then that probably would be a full day fee. But 
if what they want, is, if what the committee wants is, you know, an appearance in the afternoon to address specific issues out of a paper previously given, that could probably be a half day fee. Possibly. Paula, are you content? But you. Um, well, I'm content with the answer, but not necessarily the, the, the process. Content. Thank you. Um, Carl, are you looking in? Carl, are you muted? Do you have a question? No, I'm grand, thank you. 110, that's grand. Finland, All right, okay. 12 points. Huh? Finland, 12 points. Yes. I think uh, Mark is coming back in. The technical <laughs> issue or something? Just lost connection, I think. Okay. Sorry, Janet and Siobhan, we're, we're having... So Mark hasn't got back in, so um, if he has something that he wants to raise, we could maybe write off um, with, his, with his questions, if, if everyone's content with that. Mm -hmm. um, and, and Janet and Siobhan, thank you very much for, for dialing in, and we'll let you go now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Okie dokie. I, I do have... I suppose I do have a bit of concern in relation to this, that if we're going to have the panel of experts then advising us at every committee, then that's a cost of, of £2,500 every single meeting, and that will then be tallied against this committee, clearly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I'm, I'm still not really clear, and I suppose Paul had tried to explore it there with regards to sort of the time that would be associated with that, and obviously preparation time out with that. Um, so maybe we need to explore a little bit more around, I suppose, what it is we will expect them to yeah. do, what their expectation then will be as well. If they've been appointed as a panel of experts, well then there will be an understanding from that they will believe that they will have much more input perhaps maybe than we may need them to have. So I think I, probably we need to have a little bit more information around the expectation on this. I, I agree. I think we should write to the executive office. Yeah. Say so we've had a oral briefing by telephone, mm -hmm. uh, which has raised some concerns. Mm -hmm. Just put a marker line. And particularly if we're moving into a situation in September where we're going to be meeting weekly, um, and if we're then expected to ask them to write reports, which will be additional time onto that, I'm just mindful of... Yeah. In taking Christopher's point, we don't want five people who agree on everything, so therefore we can't invite one of the five That's right, to be. save two grand. Oh, that's right. And what if they're coming to us for an hour? They might well argue they need half a day's prep mm -hmm. or more. That's right. And then one hour is half a day. Clerk, if you want, if you have a view to this. Yeah, just to say, it's very much, it's absolutely up to the committee how often you wish to hear from the panel. That's your decision to make. Um, you're the committee and you choose when and how you, you hear from witnesses. So. Something certainly to get further consideration to. Okay, so we have a proposal that we write to the executive office um, with our concerns around sort of particularly the remuneration of the of the panel of experts and what way that's going to play out. Um, and I suppose then it's for us as a committee to decide how often we do see them going forward. We're, the next item on the agenda is is the the forward work program. Um, so. Or will we do that? Will we write to the exec office? Mm -hmm. Members happy with that, Paula? 
Get it. Um, I'm just conscious of what happened then with the Commission on Flags, Identity, Culture and Tradition in terms of that's what the headline was um, whenever they reported, you know, about £30,000, £300,000. I think that um, we, we could come under a lot of um, ridicule if we, at the far end of this, don't produce the goods, but we've spent an awful lot more public money. So it's more just about trying to protect the integrity and reputation of this process as much as anything. Right, so we have broad agreement on that. that yeah. So, so we we've got consensus. We will we'll write um, to the executive office. So, oh, sorry, Chair, would you like political declarations in that? Yes, I would. Mm -hmm. uh, if it's not, look, if it's not declared at the start, I'm stating clearly now. Did you be I asking will us? Ask them directly. I think it should be declared up front. I don't think that it's an unreasonable. I know well, myself well, and, and the clerk had a conversation about this just in, in relation to like right to a private life and, and that sort of thing. But it's if someone is a member you're referring to. Know. It's the same thing that you have to declare if you're an independent member of the policing board. Mm -hmm. If you were, are a member of a political party or have canvassed for that party in the last two years. And if it's accepted at the policing board, I see no reason why it shouldn't be accepted for the panel of experts here. I think that's perfectly legitimate. I don't see any GDPR or other type implications from that. Actually, if you declare it, I don't see it as conflict of interest, necessarily. No. I just yeah. think it's important that people happy? know. If, the, if this is supposed to be an independent panel of experts, I think it's important that we know how they are. Independent? Yes. Yeah. And um, Certainly members can seek further information if members wish. Um, there may be a differential between asking a witness to declare a political affiliation and a remunerated member of a panel. Um, you know, we have to look at issues as is it justifiable, is it proportionate and legitimate? Um, it's something that we can seek further information on if members witnesses, wish. Witnesses, I, I never suggested that witnesses should be asked to declare political affiliation but to memory. Um, but I did say, in terms of this panel, that that, I think, was legitimate. Okay, that's all right. I think that's cleared it up. I, I, I had understood that it was in relation to witnesses, but no, maybe, no. That, maybe that's... Um, no, I think... We were referring to, to someone uh, weeks yeah. ago. Yeah. Well, we, that's grand, so we have an agreement that we're going to write. I think that's yes. what we were... Okay, so the next item, then, is our forward work plan. Mm -hmm. And... Um, this is agenda item number seven, and you can find that at page 85. So, um, the, the proposal here is that we have another meeting for the next two fortnights, and then we allow recess and then kick off again in September. So, from September, we'd be having weekly meetings to allow the committee to hear evidence and different view viewpoints over the course of the work. Um, listed in that we have potential committee visits to London and then to Dublin. Um, so obviously that's going to be dependent on how the, the pandemic that's happening at the minute plays out. So if members are content to note the forward work plan mm -hmm. and the members that are attending us remotely, are they content to note? Sure. Can, I, can I just hand on the last point? I was trying to raise my hand. Oh, sorry, Carl, um, didn't see you. No, you're grand. Um, I would like to see some guidance on the difference between uh, conflicts of interest and political declarations. Um, because, um, I mean, even witnesses will be should be asked, do they have any conflicts of interest? And I know that's different from a panel of experts. So if we could get that, that would be helpful. Um, and I, I, I have no issue with the forward work pro, pro, program. I think we're all um, trying to work our way through COVID. So whatever we need to do, we'll do within the next couple of fortnights. Thank you. Okay, okay. Everyone else content? Yes. Yep. Is that us? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So any other business? No. And no one attend remotely has any other business? 
And so the next meeting will be Thursday the 18th of June in this room 29 at 2pm. That's us. Closed. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 29.